Good afternoon, guys. Um, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Uh, I'm glad it's quieting down a little bit. I thought all my experience of going out drinking in nightclubs was about to come in useful, having to uh, speak over the music. So, um, my name is Richard. I'm the uh, founder and editor of Beauty Business Journal. So, what I'm going to do here today is just uh, take you through, give you some context as to who I am and give you a little bit of background on Beauty Business Journal. And then I'm going to talk you through how to build a media, well, why I believe you should think about building a media business or thinking like a media business for your business, how to build that digital supply chain. And then I'm going to go through how you can start tomorrow morning if you wanted to do it, if you think there's value in it for you. And I'll finish off with a little bit of Q&A. So just to give you some context, uh, I've been a marketer for 15 odd years. Um, I've worked across B2B, B2C, FMCG. I uh, walked across multiple industries, and I, I was actually uh, head of digital marketing for Beauty World for a number of years. Um, so for about five or six years, I was actually uh, running all their PPC, influencer marketing, content marketing, content strategy, everything. So if you happen to, uh, to attend Beauty World over the last few years and you somehow are being stalked around the internet by banner ads or uh, social ads or getting email, uh, get stuck in email workflows. That was probably down to me. Um, I left a couple of years ago and I decided to pursue other projects. But one of the projects I decided to pursue was Beauty Business Journal. It, the reason, so I'll tell you a story about why I started this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was having a conversation with somebody that's actually on the floor today um, about investing in content marketing and why it's an interesting idea to potentially layer a media business on top of a traditional business. And that individual said, look, look, there's for, as, a, as a traditional business that's attending is a show like this, uh, content marketing doesn't work for us. Uh, thinking about building a media component into our marketing is absolutely insane. Um, so I took that as kind of an opportunity, a challenge to myself. I thought, uh, is it possible to create a media business that you can layer on top of a traditional business, but approach it like a marketer rather, rather than approaching, I guess, like a typical publishing house down, you know, down the road like ITP or whatever the case it was. So I guess two years on from that conversation, um, we're six figures in annual recurring revenue since we turned subscription last year. Um, we generate revenue through affiliate marketing, sponsorship. We, but more importantly, actually, what we do is we have over 100,000 people on our site every month um, that are looking for the latest in thought leadership or educational content. Um, and we generally speak to around 200,000 people, uh, give or take, across all our platforms together. So um, the reason I'm telling that story is because um, I suppose when I think of that conversation with that individual, um, I'm sure he would love to be talking to 100, 200,000 people or 200,000 potential customers every single month. And this is where I feel that when we think about modern marketing and the changes that are happening and the changes that are happening, I suppose, in the relationship with consumers and the way brands approach their communication channels, for me, starting to think more like a media business is where the opportunity lies over the next 10 years. So I guess, well, why should you guys start? So if you're running, let's say, a B2B organization or you're running, you're in consumer or whatever the case is, why should you start thinking like a media business first in terms of your communications? And I suppose there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that if you have a strong connection and a strong uh, relationship with your audience and you can maintain that on an ongoing basis, then you can generate demand and interest in your product range or your new launches or your new market entries anytime you want. If you're speaking to an audience, let's say, um, on a weekly basis or a couple of times a week or whenever the case it is, and you're delivering value, you're delivering insights, you're delivering data, then of course, you can decide at what opportunities you want to um, share information about your business. In some instances, you might even be able to predict the trends depending on how influential you, you, uh, you, you are in your particular niche. There's another reason also, and that's around developing product strategy. From what I've seen and some of the examples that I've seen is those brands that are in constant communication and constant contact with their audience get access to so much more insights and data rather than those companies that tend to rent their other audiences. And what I mean by that is those that have built communities, those that have built uh, relationships through newsletters or other types of mediums, access insights and data that allows them to shape their actual product, um, uh, product uh, delivery and their product strategy. 
And I suppose just coming off that, there's a, there is another layer to that as well. And it's something that I've come across so many times over the years. And it's about, I suppose it's around the idea of, of owning versus renting an audience. And for me, there's a lot of problems with, if you're, if, I suppose if you look at the, the next 10 years and what's about to happen in marketing and what's about to happen in communications, if your whole marketing strategy revolves around renting an audience, that's buying Facebook ads or uh, buying ads on Google. You're at the mercy of technology and algorithm changes all of the time. And it's just going to get more expensive. You're going to get less and less um, access to data that you've had to rely on over the last couple of years. But if you think about owning an audience, and I suppose coming back to this idea of building a media element into your marketing communication strategy, and thinking about layering on a media business on top of your, your, your current structure, you can own the relationship with your audience. You can communicate with them anytime you like. You can deliver whatever news you like, as long as you're de delivering insights data, whatever the case it is. And so there's a great examples about it. There's, there's tons of examples, to be honest. I'm sure uh, Glossier, uh, yeah, Glossier is, uh, a lot of you are familiar with it. That started as a blog by an intern at Vogue in 2012. Um, she, she was so in touch with her audience. She was doing like 1.5 million hits a month, I think, on her site before she actually launched Glossy. It was Into the Gloss was actually the, the blog that it was called. Uh, now it's a billion, a billion dollar business. But she was able to do that because she had access to all the data, all the insights. She knew what was missing in the market. She knew what the opportunities and the categories, et cetera, et cetera. And when I, I and of course, makeup.com is another one, owned by Laria. But I always like the idea of like, who is doing it? In a, uh, I mean, sorry. Um, if that's anyone here, <laughs> okay. Um, so well, I always like the idea of how people are approaching their content strategy and how people are approaching the way their media brand looks. Um, if they have a, t a tr I suppose, a traditional D to C business or whatever the case is. So. Um, Thinking like me, so one of my favorite examples, sorry, I should have been doing this as we went along. One of my favorite examples is Allure magazine. And for any of you that aren't familiar with Allure magazine, it's a digital and print publication in the US that targets a, 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 de a female demographic. And what, sorry, what Allure do is they spotted a niche, they spotted an opportunity where Five years ago, they were creating content like this, you know, how colorism shapes black girlhood or whatever the case is, listicles, like 22 sunscreens uh, that don't get, leave a white, whatever. Um, but I, at some point in time, they decided to pick a niche and a specialization and how they could become a destination for answering awkward questions. So they went from producing content like this to producing content like this. So... You may find it awkward, I guess, to some extent, asking your relatives or your friends, what's the best wart cream uh, you can find on the market? Probably not something you're gonna ask your colleague or whatever the case, you know? Um, but what you will do, if you're not going to ask somebody, you're gonna go to Google. And what, what Allure have done is they've built a reputation within the industry. They've built themselves out as a destination where if you are searching for search terms related to what you might deem awkward questions, they're more often than not turning up in search. And you can see the results here. They started this around uh, January 2017. Uh, started, in, as, as you would expect, a few months in, it's going to take some time to get moving. From January onwards, you can see the lifter now at uh, just over 5 million organic uh, uh, organic hits a month, along with all of the backlink information that they are, all of the backlinks they're acquiring, all of the organic keywords that they're now ranking for. Um, if you want additional information on this, uh, I actually have it on my website. I know the plug has come early there, but beautybusinessjournal.com, all of the actual full research is there, and you can see how actually um, Allure built out their content strategy and how they went about being that destination where, um, where you, you, you could find an answer to a potentially awkward question. So what I want to move on to next is, if you have thought about a strong content strategy and 
how exactly you want to approach your particular niche and how you think you can deliver value and insights to your audience. And you're becoming, I suppose, author the authority in that niche. And you're building a loyal following and a, a, a loyal kind of uh, group of people that are willing to engage you. The next best thing, actually, after that is building a community around those people. And I have a lot of experience, actually, in understanding community dynamics and community building. And I'll share some examples with you in a second. But again, it comes back to that idea you know, of if you have an engaged community around your brand and you look at the likes of Beauty Bay or Glossy and all of them, again, you get access to just insights that you just typically won't get by just running paid ads or just pushing content or pushing information adverts out to your audience. If you have them bought in, you're building advocacy amongst the group. You're collecting data and information related to what they're interested in, what they're not interested in. But the real value, the real magic happens, and I've seen this in a couple of instances, is when a community comes together and they start finding value in, what, in, 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 uh, in each other, the magic is that they start providing real value to each other and the community becomes self-sufficient to some extent. And these are three examples. I picked these uh, individuals um, because they're absolutely nothing related to beauty. And I just want to do, explain to you a little bit about how communities happen, how you can build them, and some of the people that are having success in tech, mental health, and finance. And these particular individuals have had extraordinary success in building out content strategies around uh, yeah, the subjects that I mentioned and building communities on top of it. And in some instance, I'll take this uh, individual, David Gerhardt, for example. He's in the tech space. He runs, uh, he's a CMO for a company called Drift in the US. Um, as part of it, it's an application for Shopify or whatever the case is. So he's become quite authoritative and quite an influencer on LinkedIn. He decided to start sharing his knowledge with the, uh, with the industry in the tech space. And he now charges $10 a month for access to his Facebook group which is now two and a half thousand people in. And what I've found over the course of uh, following him over the last year is that most of the time he's, he's actually not present. It's the individuals that are in that group that are asking questions around SEO, influencer marketing, demand generation, lead generation, or whatever the case it is. And the community are providing value themselves. What he's also being able to do, or what he's also being able to learn, is when he started this a Patreon account, is how he originally started, he went on to build this DGMG University, which now has thousands of members in it, charging $300 a month. But sorry, look, before I go off track, my point being here is that the opportunity to leverage community around your content strategy is a great place to leverage uh, advocacy, gain data, gain insights, and understand what exactly your audience is looking for. So I'll move on to zero party data. Um, I won't bore you with the technicalities of this, but it's, in my eyes, it's the third component of building a digital supply chain that helps you build a media brand that you can layer on top of a traditional business. Um, I found this tweet, I thought it was super interesting. I'm not sure if any of you remember, um, back in, in May, there was an iOS update around privacy and uh, Apple basically uh, limited access to a lot of the data that they were previously sharing with uh, the search and social platforms. Um, and what's happening now is that um, the information, the data loop that exists is no longer existing like it used to be over the last 10 years. Um, and this is what's going to happen from this year onwards. Google has also announced that from 2022 onwards, zero, you will have no access to third party data. Long story short, what that means is you're not going to know what ads are really working for you. You're not going to understand the demographic that uh, are not going to have a, the same level of information on the demographic you're targeting. And also your costs are going to absolutely rocket. So what's the solution? If your, your whole strategy for the last 10 years is on buying ads on Facebook and search, well, it's about building a relationship with your audience, about building a media business that you can connect on a regular basis on your own terms that you're not affected by algorithms, you're not affected by changes in laws and regulations and GDPR and all that kind of stuff. So I won't go too much further into that. What I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today then is how can you start yourself? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Beauty Business Journal because when I was told that uh, it was an absolute waste of time thinking about building a media business and it was even greater 
waste of time and resources doing this. Um, I approached this like a digital marketer rather than a journalist. So I looked at like the resources that I had in terms of uh, the, the individuals uh, that would be required, the tech, stack, the tech stack that was also going to be required. And uh, this is, of course, the uh, design and creative resources that are also going to be needed. And what I kind of understood was um, there's a perception that, you know, if you want to start a magazine, you're going to need copywriters and editors and creative people. And, um, and actually, that is true. I learned that the hard way. But, uh, but that comes down the line. If you have a marketing department, if you can at least dedicate one resource and decide on the type of structure that you want to move forward with, whether it's a, 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 you know, your own branded publication, maybe it's just a newsletter that you intend on putting out once or twice a week, you can actually start building that, you know, that kind of independent brand away from your, your existing business and start owning that relationship with the audience. Um, and how simple is it? Well, I mean, for me, it was different. I, I, I'm actually a marketer by heart, and I'm quite, I have a good technical understanding. So I built a website, a few integrations, email lists, whatever the case is. But it's become so simple now today. Substack, Ghost, MailChimp. All of the individuals that I showed you um, just previously, only one of them did it like me, and that was that lady, uh, Marie Lecoff, that was in mental health. The other two guys just started it on Substack or on Patreon. And they've gone on to build enormous audiences that are paying to receive their information on a regular basis. But could you imagine if you, if you had a, if you, if you were Euro Fragrance, for example, down there, or CPL Aromas, or any of these major co corporations that are investing in so much different, uh, different channels like PR and content strategy and all that kind of different thing. If you were able to build a media arm that allowed you to access uh, your audience at any given time, and you can announce, you can make your own announcements, your own releases, or whatever the case it is. That's where the opportunity is to be able to speak to, uh, you know, 100, 200,000 people a month. Um, so, look, I won't go on too much further. Um, if you want to start today, you can start this morning, or sorry, you can start tomorrow morning. Substack account, start sharing your ideas, start branding yourself as this certain individual with, uh, with thoughts and knowledge. If you're in a marketing department, you can start building out your your own media operations based on this model as well. And guys, if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, I really appreciate it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's on? All right. Um, so when you started Beauty Business Journal, let's say I wanted to do something similar that, that, that you've done. When do you start to see a return on it? How, how many months, how many years? I imagine that it's not an overnight success. Well, it depends what, yeah. Sorry. It depends uh, what, on what you define as success, for starters. Um, if, it's, uh, if I was, let's say, talking to a company that's here that already has a lot of marketing resources, you can define success by, let's say, number of subscribers, click-through rates, uh, read, you know, the amount of time that's being read uh, on your site or whatever the case is. I mean, if you're operating independently and you want to uh, build an audience, it's email lists, how, you, how much you can grow your email lists. Lots of those kind of vanity metrics to some extent. But of course, uh, there is a financial model that can be built in. If you do start charging, which you can on all of these platforms, actually, you can charge what you want per month for access to your content. Then, of course, I think um, you can define success by that. In terms of how long it's going to take, it takes um, a lot longer than you would expect. Um, if you're launching a new brand, okay, maybe if it's the case there's an established brand at this show and you're launching some form of a media business on the back of this, then of course you have some level of brand, uh, brand liquidity to tip into or to tap into. But if you're starting from scratch, uh, I didn't start seeing results until probably a year into the project. Um, Having said that, there wasn't an enormous investment in it either. You know, for me, it was very much kind of a, a marketing project to see, could I, yeah, could I build a media business as a marketer rather than a journalist? Could I rank for search terms? And could I drive audiences through thought leadership and educational content rather than... See, I'll tell you, actually, I'll just get on the back of that. What I found with my particular audience, and this is the thing, as you, as you, as you grow over time with your, with, with your media business, 
you will start to learn what they want and what they don't want. Like, I hate to say it, but nobody cares. Well, certainly my audience don't care about a new warehouse down in Jebel Ali. Nobody. I get so many press releases around this. so uninteresting. But what they do want to know is, if it's the case that I've opened, a, if it's the case that one of my, you know, customers has opened a new warehouse, Jebel Ali, then how much did they save doing that on freight and transport costs by localizing the warehouse and distribution here? And how did they pass that saving on to the customers in order to increase sales by X amount? They want data, they want insights, and all and all that thing. That's just for my particular audience. You may find with other individuals that they have other goals, um, other levels of or other types of brand awareness they want to create or whatever. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Yeah, it does. Yeah. And, um, sorry, my second question is, um, what's next for Beauty Business Journal? Oh, to be as bo big as Vogue Business. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> next year. <laughs> Let's get Thank through you. this year first. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. That's all? Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate you attending. <laughs>